Good afternoon. I'm Commander Abad Khan, and I'm representing the Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity, COCA, with the Emergency Risk Communication Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'd like to welcome you to today's COCA call, 2019 to 2020 recommendations for influenza prevention and treatment in children, an update for pediatric providers. You may participate in today's presentation via webinar, or you may download the slides if you are unable to access the webinar. The PowerPoint slides and the webinar link can be found on our COCA webpage at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. Again, the web address is emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. Free continuing education is offered for this webinar. Instructions on how to earn continuing education will be provided at the end of the call. In compliance with continuing education requirements, CDC, our planners, our presenters, and their spouses, partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. Planners have reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. Content will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use, except for specific unapproved uses of antivirals and influenza vaccine recommended by CDC, AAP, and ACOG. CDC did not accept commercial support for this continuing education activity. After the speakers have presented, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. You may submit questions at any time through the webinar system by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and then typing your question. For those who have media questions, please contact CDC Media Relations at 404-639-3286 or send an email to media at cdc.gov. If you're a patient, please refer your questions to your healthcare provider. At the conclusion of the session, the participants will be able to accomplish the following. Examine data from the 2018 to 2019 US influenza season to inform preparations for the 2019 to 2020 influenza season. Highlight key recommendations in the AAP influenza policy statement, recommendations for prevention and control influenza in children 2019 to 2020, and in the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices document, Prevention and Control of Seasonal Influenza with Vaccines, Recommendations of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, United States 2019 to 2020 Influenza Season. And discuss recommendations for using influenza antivirals in children. Now we would like to welcome our two presenters, Dr. Fatima Daoud and Dr. Flor Munoz. Dr. Fatima Daoud is a medical epidemiologist in the influenza division at CDC. She completed her medical degree and pediatric residency at Johns Hopkins University. During her tenure at CDC, Dr. Daoud has worked on analyses and studies in the United States, Thailand, India, and Central America focused on describing the burden of influenza, identifying risk factors for severe outcomes with influenza virus infection, evaluating influenza vaccine efficacy and effectiveness, and evaluating the efficacy of influenza antiviral medications. Dr. Flor Munoz is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. She's also a member of the Committee on Infectious Diseases of the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as a Committee on Infectious Diseases representative on the Influenza Working Group of the ACIP. Thank you to both of our presenters for joining us today. Dr. Dawood, please proceed. Thanks very much. Um, so for today's presentation, I'll be covering three topic areas. I'll start with a brief overview of surveillance data from the last influenza season, the 2018-19 season. Then uh, review information on CDC's recommendations for use of influenza antiviral medications. And third, uh, provide an update on the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices influenza recommendations for this coming season. Next slide, please. So looking back on the last influenza season, the 2018-19 season, this was a season considered of moderate severity. When we compare it to the previous season, the 2017-18 season, influenza-related hospitalization rates were higher for adults, but similar for children. And we saw activity begin to increase in November and then peak around mid-February. 
this past season was a record-breaking season in the sense that influenza-like illness, or ILI, uh, was actually above baseline for 21 weeks, making it the longest season in 10 years. And we saw two waves of influenza A activity of similar magnitude, but very little influenza B. During the first part of the season, influenza A, H1N1, PDM09 viruses predominated. And then starting in mid-February, we saw predominance of AH3N2 viruses for the remainder of the season. The majority of the circulating H1 and B Victorian B lineage, uh, Yamagata vi lineage viruses were similar to the reference viruses that were in last year's influenza vaccine. But in contrast, we saw a fair amount of genetic diversity among the circulating H3 viruses. And the majority of these viruses were actually antigenically distinct from the reference virus in last year's vaccine. Next slide, please. So the next several slides will show you data from uh, some of CDC's influenza surveillance systems to illustrate uh, the topics that I just mentioned on the previous slide. So this slide shows data from the CDC Influenza-like Illness Network, or ILI-Net, um, that collects data from outpatient clinics. And the lines on the graph show the past seven seasons, with this most recent season shown in red with the triangles. On the y-axis, we have the percent of visits that were due to ILI or influenza-like illness, and on the x-axis, we have calendar weeks. So for this last season, ILI was associated with a moderate proportion of visits reported to this network. The peak is lower than what we saw in the previous season, the 2017-18 season, but the number of weeks above baseline is prolonged compared to other prior seasons. Next slide. This slide illustrates the types of viruses that we saw circulating last season. We have two graphs here. The bar graph, um, bar, the bar graph show the results of influenza positive tests that were reported to CDC in the top graph by US clinical labs, and then in the bottom graph by public health laboratories. So if we start with the top graph, um, most of the clinical laboratories do not subtype the majority of specimens. And so we have the data broken out by all A viruses shown in yellow and then all B viruses shown in green. And we can see overall there was a predominance of influenza A viruses with very little detection of B viruses. And then when we look at the bottom graph, this shows data from the public health laboratories that do subtype out influenza A viruses and also conduct lineage testing for B viruses. And we can see that early in the season, there was a predominance of AH1N1 viruses with some H3 detection. And then as the season progresses, the predominance switches to AH3N2 predominance. And then lastly, in the inset at the, on the bottom graph, we can see a magnified view of the last weeks of this uh, most recent season. And it illustrates that we have seen some B Victoria detection over the summer months in parts of the United States, specifically in some areas in the southeastern United States. Next slide. So this graph shows incidences of laboratory confirmed influenza associated hospitalizations. These are per 100,000 population. And these data are collected through CDC's flu serve net surveillance system. These data are presented as cumulative rates. So we do expect the lines to go up as you move from the left to the right of the graph. On the X axis again, we have uh, weeks. And on the Y axis now we have rates per 100,000 population. The most recent season as shown, the 2018-19 season is shown in green and also marked with the red arrow. And you can see that in this most recent season, the hospitalization rates began to increase a bit earlier than prior seasons. And the overall cumulative rate for the season was 63.9 hospitalizations per 100,000. Next slide. So this uh, slide summarizes mortality data in two graphs. On the left side, we have data on pneumonia and influenza mortality. Uh, these data are collected by the National Center for Health Statistics, and they come largely from death certificate data. These are not lab necessarily laboratory-confirmed influenza cases. And the graph shows the percent of all deaths reported that were due to pneumonia and influenza on the y-axis and then epidemiologic weeks on the x-axis. And we can see the 2015 season onwards. So the most recent season, again, the 2018-19 season is on the rightmost part of the graph. And we can see there's a moderate peak, um, but it's certainly not as high as what we saw in the 2017-18 season. 
Then if we turn to the right-hand graph, we can see data here from CDC's Pediatric Influenza Mortality Surveillance System. Uh, deaths of children that are associated with a laboratory-confirmed influenza have been reported to CDC since 2004. And so here, these are laboratory-confirmed deaths. And for this past season, there were a total of 135 deaths reported. Next slide. This slide summarizes results from a severity index that takes into consideration outpatient visits, hospitalizations, and deaths. And the slide shows uh, the severity uh, classification for 16 seasons going back to the 2003-04 season, and also includes a 2009-10 pandemic season when the H1N1 PDM09 virus first emerged. So this past season was considered to be a moderate severity season, both overall and by age for children, adults, and older adults. Next slide. On this slide, we have preliminary burden estimates for this past season. Um, for the 2018-19 season, it was estimated that influenza resulted in 37 to 43 million illnesses, 17 to 20 million medical visits, 500,000 to 650,000 flu hospitalizations and roughly 36,000 to 61,000 deaths. These are preliminary estimates and will be updated as additional data become available. Next slide. So this is the last surveillance slide that I'll show in my presentation. It shows a snapshot of influenza detection in the Southern Hemisphere for the past several months, um, which is their winter season. These bar graphs show results of influenza positive tests that are reported to the World Health Organization FluNet system for various regions in the Southern Hemisphere. So we can see that detection varies from region to region in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, in some regions saw a predominance of the H1N1 virus shown in the lightest blue color, whereas other regions saw predominance of the H3N2 virus shown in the medium blue or teal bars. And some regions also saw some lower level B virus detection. These data are informative, but it's important to know that we cannot predict necessarily what is going to happen in the North Northern Hemisphere based solely on these data. As we know, flu is unpredictable. Next slide. Uh, here are some links to additional sources of surveillance data as we head into this upcoming flu season. Um, typically, beginning in October, we start to have more detailed reports um, as the U.S. influenza activity may start to pick up. Uh, the FluView website is a particularly good resource to check back with periodically. It has uh, weekly reports during the flu season and then a component called FluView Interactive, which is an online application where you can pull down data and look at it both by different seasons as well as by different age groups. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn to a review of current influenza antiviral treatment recommendations. For the most part, the recommendations this year are unchanged from last season, but I will mention a newer antiviral drug that was licensed during the last season a bit later in this talk. Uh, first, as a reminder, antiviral treatment is recommended as early as possible for any patient with confirmed or suspected influenza in one of three groups. Those who are hospitalized, those who have severe, complicated, or progressive illness, and those who are at high risk for flu complications. Next slide. So let's review who's considered at high risk for influenza complications and for whom antiviral treatment is recommended. The high risk groups include children who are younger than two years of age, adults 65 years of age and older, pregnant and postpartum women, children um, 18 years and younger who are on long-term aspirin therapy, American Indians and Alaska Natives, people with underlying medical conditions, and residents of nursing homes and chronic care facilities. Next slide, please. The current recommendations make a distinction between those for whom antiviral treatment is recommended, which are the three groups that we talked about a few slides ago and are also shown again at the top of this slide, and then those for whom antiviral treatment can be considered. Antiviral treatment can be considered based on clinical judgment for any previously healthy symptomatic outpatient who is not part of a high-risk group and who has confirmed or suspected influence on the basis of clinical judgment uh, if the treatment can be initiated within 48 hours of illness onset. Next slide. 
So for this season, there are four FDA-approved antiviral medications that are recommended for use in the United States. Three of these are neuraminidase inhibitors, and they include oseltamivir, zanamivir, and paramivir. And the fourth is a newer antiviral medication uh, that was licensed last season. This is a CAP-dependent endonuclease inhibitor called baloxavir. Next slide. This table summarizes some of the differences between the four available antiviral treatments. Oseltamivir and baloxavir are both oral medications, whereas zanamivir is administered using a discaler device, and paramivir is an intravenous medication. Oseltamivir can be given to anyone of any age, that includes babies. Zanamivir is licensed for treatment in people ages seven and up. Um, another thing to note about zanamivir it is, as, is that since it is an inhaled medication and has been associated with bronchospasm, it is not recommended for anyone with underlying airway disease. Param paramivir is approved for use in children two years and up and baloxavir in people 12 years and up. And then two of these drugs are also approved and recommended for chemoprophylaxis. Those include oseltamivir for children three months and up and then zanamivir for children five years and up. Next slide. So this slide gives a bit more information on the newest antiviral medication, baloxavir marboxyl. Uh, as mentioned, this is a CAP-dependent endonuclease inhibitor um, that acts through a new mechanism of action compared to the neuraminidase inhibitors. Um, baloxavir blocks viral replication. It was approved by the FDA during October of 2018 for the treatment of acute uncomplicated influenza in patients who are 12 through 64 years of age. It is given as an oral single dose and the dosage is based on weight. So for persons 40 to less than 80 kilograms, it's one 40 milligram dose. And then for those 80 kilograms and over, it's one 80 milligram dose. Um, in clinical trials, baloxavir was associated with a shorter time to alleviation of symptoms compared to placebo, and then also associated with significantly more rapid decline in viral load and shorter durations of virus detection than oseltamivir or placebo. Similar to what we know about the neuraminidase inhibitors, um, the greatest clinical benefit for uh, baloxavir treatment was seen with when treatment was initiated early after illness onset. And lastly, um, the emergence of viral escape mutants with reduced susceptibility has been seen in some clinical trials in some small family clusters. So this is something that's important to continue to monitor. Next slide. So for this last section of the talk, I'm going to review the ACI P recommendations for influenza vaccination for the current season, the 2018-20, uh, sorry, the 2019-2020 season. Next slide. For the most part, the groups recommended for vaccination are unchanged from last season. Routine annual influenza vaccination is recommended for all persons six months of age and older who do not have a contraindication to vaccination. While vaccination is recommended for everyone in this age group, there are some for whom it's particularly important to get vaccinated, and this includes people who are six months, and eight, six months of age and older who are at increased risk of complications or severe illness from influenza, and contacts and caregivers of children under the age of five years, persons 50 years of age and older, and people with medical conditions that place them at higher risk for influenza complications. Next slide. Next slide, please. So this slide summarizes the groups that are considered at increased risk for influenza complications and severe illness um, for the purposes of vaccination. And these groups include children uh, six months through 59 months of age, as well as adults 50 years of age and older, people with chronic medical conditions or immunosuppressive conditions, women who are or will be pregnant during the influenza season, children and adolescents who are receiving aspirin or salicylate containing medications that would place them at risk for Rye syndrome after influenza virus infection, residents of nursing homes and other long-term care facilities, American Indians and Alaska Natives, and persons who are extremely obese with a body mass index of 40 or greater. Next slide. For this upcoming season, we do have a few updates um, to the recommendations. First, there is an update to the strain composition of the 2019-20 vaccine. And second, there are labeling changes to two of the vaccines. 
next slide. First, in terms of the strain composition for the 2019-20 vaccine, the trivalent vaccine, which has three influenza viruses represented, will contain an A Brisbane-like H1N1 virus, an A Kansas-like H3N2 virus, and a B Colorado-like virus, uh, which represents the Victoria lineage. The, both the H1N1 and H3N2 two components of the vaccine are updated this season compared to last season. Then for the quadrivalent viruses, which have four influenza viruses represented, these will contain the same three viruses as in the trivalent vaccine, plus a B. Phuket-like virus representing the Yamagata lineage. Um, it's noteworthy that all vaccines for the pediatric age group this upcoming season are now quadrivalent. Next slide. The second change we'll review pertains to labeling changes for influenza vaccines for young children six through 35 months of age. There are two changes. For Afluria quadrivalent, the age indication has been expanded from approval for children five years and up to now approval for children six months and up. The dose volume for younger children, that's children six through 35 months of age is 0.25 ml. And for children three years of age and older, it's 0.5 ml. The second change pertains to flu zone quadrivalent. Uh, for this upcoming season, the dose volume for children six through 35 months of age has now been expanded to include two options, either 0.25 ml or 0.5 ml. Previously, only 0.25 ml was approved for this age group. Next slide. This slide gives some brief background about the use of influenza vaccines in the youngest age group children six through 35 months of age as context for the labeling changes that I mentioned on the previous slide. Historically, children in this age group were recommended to receive a 0.25 ml dose of inactivated influenza vaccine. That's half of the 0.5 ml dose that's recommended for older children and adults. And this recommendation came about as a result of studies that had been conducted with whole virus inactivated influenza vaccines, which showed a higher rate of febrile reactions after vaccination in this age group. But since roughly 2000, the 2000-2001 2000, season, whole virus inactivated influenza vaccines have not been used in the United States and instead have been replaced with split virus and subunit inf inactivated influenza vaccines. But the half dose uh, recommendation did remain even after whole virus vaccine was no longer being used. And in the recent influenza seasons before the 2016-17 season, this youngest age group, the six th through 35 month age group, only had flu zone and then later flu zone quadrivalent that was available at the 0.25 ml dose. Next slide. But as a result of recent licensure changes, we now have more options for this age group. There are four inactivated influenza vaccines licensed for use now in six through 35 month olds. One thing that's important to be aware of though is that the dose volume differs for these vaccines in this age group. So for children um, in this age group, Flulaval and Fluorix quadrivalent are both licensed at 0.5 ml doses. A Fluoria quadrivalent is licensed at a 0.25 ml dose. And then as mentioned previously, flu zone quadrivalent is now licensed to be used at either a 0.25 ml dose or a 0.5 ml dose with no preference given to either dose volume. Because there are several different products available for this age group and the dose volumes are different, it's important to be aware of these differences and administer the appropriate dose. For children three years of age and older and for older and for adults, the dose volume is 0.5 ml for all of the inactivated vaccines. Next slide. So this is the last slide in my presentation and includes some additional CDC resources as we head into the upcoming flu season. Um, this includes some links to the influenza surveillance and vaccination coverage data, as well as to the ACIP influenza vaccine recommendations that we reviewed today and the antiviral treatment recommendations that we reviewed. Thank you very much. And I will turn things over to Dr. Munoz for the second part of the presentation. Thank you very much. My focus of this presentation will be to present to you the recommendations for influenza prevention in children from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Next slide, please. 
The American Academy of Pediatrics Committee of Infectious Diseases is the body that is in charge of reviewing the influenza data on epidemiology, vaccines, and antivirals, and then providing the recommendations for prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of influenza in children. Um, as part of the information, uh, please be aware that in addition to the Committee of Infectious Diseases members, which are voting members and also liaisons to various um, different organizations that deal with uh, children in the United States, there are various committees, councils, sections, and even the board of the AAP um, who participate in the development of these recommendations. Next, next slide, please. Uh, the recommendations are available in different uh, forms. Um, so the, one of them is uh, also uh, the Red Book and the Red Book Online. And the, there are updates that are made in real time if you need to be aware of these. Next slide, please. But uh, the main publication that uh, presents these recommendations is uh, put out in pediatrics. And this is the actual policy statement that was released early this year on September 2nd, 2019. And the publication will be part of the pediatrics journal uh, October issue for your review. Next slide, please. The um, announcement of the release of these recommendations came out in AAP News on September 2nd, as I mentioned, and there is a link on this announcement and uh, also uh, through the um, website uh, for of the AAP to be able to have access to these recommendations of the policy statement. Next slide, please. This is a summary of the recommendations and the updates available for the 2019-2020 season. And what you will see is that uh, the recommendations of the AAP are aligned with the CDC ACIP recommendations. As you have already heard, the um, IIV, inactivated influenza vaccine given as a shot, and LAIV, the live attenuated influenza vaccine given as a nasal spray, are both recommended for children this season. Vaccines for children this year are all going to be quadrivalent vaccines. This is the first time this happens. And also, as uh, Dr. Dawood has mentioned, there are new formulations for inactivated influenza vaccine for children 6 to 35 months of age. Um, the AAP policy statement and recommendations also provide guidance on dosing for influenza vaccine in different age groups and mentions the new antiviral medication for children. Next slide, please. So in terms of who should be vaccinated, this is uh, very much uh, in harmonized with the ACIP recommendations where you see that the AP recommends that everyone who is at least six months of age should receive their influenza vaccine. The high risk groups for uh, potential concerns of serious complications from influenza are uh, very much in concordance as well. Um, children less than five and people over 65 years of age are considered at risk. And uh, those that have certain medical conditions, in this case for pediatrics, we do include uh, neuromuscular disease and any child that also has problems with swallowing that could result in aspiration and complications for pneumonia. In addition to that, you see the typical groups, patients with asthma, chronic lung or heart disease, immune suppression, patients with metabolic diseases like diabetes and obesity, as well as pregnant women. We do make an emphasis of making sure that household contacts and caregivers of these children, especially if they have high-risk conditions, are also vaccinated, and uh, certainly healthcare personnel in order to protect young children. Next slide, please. This is just a visual summary of these populations at high risk. And um, probably one comment I should make now is that for the AAP recommendations, the um, high risk groups uh, for both vaccination and antiviral treatment are the same, uh, with children under five being considered at risk, noting that the um, ACIP recommendations make an emphasis on those under two. Um, but this is um, pretty concordant uh, in terms of the rest of the different uh, populations at risk. Next slide, please. 
In addition to that, other comments regarding the recommendations for 2019 and 2020 for the AAP is that um, the uh, vaccines that are appropriate for age and health status of children should be used for this universal influenza immunization and that any vaccine can be used with no preference for one type or another type of vaccine. Similarly, uh, the most important change is the fact that this year the AAP expresses no preferences for inactivated influenza vaccine over the live um, influenza vaccine. And um, we continue to focus on vaccination occurring before the onset of influenza activity in the community in order to ensure protection. This is going to be especially true for those young uh, children that need two doses. And for those children, we do want to make sure that vaccination is offered as soon as the vaccine becomes available and that uh, complete vaccination is ideally um, achieved by the end of October for every child. We also recognize that it is difficult to sometimes achieve this goal of vaccinating by end of October. Therefore, vaccination should continue to be offered as long as influenza is circulating in the community to provide protection. Next slide, please. I would like to focus a little bit on the uh, change in the um, recommendation for uh, IIV and LAIV and uh, give you a little bit about the background on how this, uh, this decision was made. The uh, AAP News in March uh, provided the first notice of the AAP change in this recommendation expressing no preference of IIV over LAIV for this season. And this is the publication that we uh, put out. Next slide, please. The rationale for this change in recommendation included a revision of data by uh, the Committee of Infectious Diseases of the AAP uh, during the spring meeting of 2019. And this is the data that was available at the time that was reviewed by the committee. This included the preliminary vaccine effectiveness data against medically attended influenza in the United States, which was preliminary at the time. We also looked at preliminary vaccine effectiveness data for the live influenza vaccine outside of the United States because the live vaccine was being utilized mostly in other countries. And uh, any other uh, final vaccine effectiveness that was available for the previous season, 2017-18, outside of the United States for the LAIV. Importantly, the committee also noted that no additional vaccine effectiveness data would be available until the end of the 2018-19 influenza season, which as you've heard was a very prolonged uh, season. And therefore um, it was important to try to provide some guidance to providers regarding the utilization of the influenza vaccines uh, for the upcoming season at the time they were going to be prepared carrying their orders uh, for obtaining influenza vaccine for their practices. Um, it was also noted uh, by the committee that it was important to provide harmonization of recommendations with ACIP, which continue to express no preference between IIV and LAIV for uh, the past season and no plans to make any change in those recommendations for the upcoming 2019 to 20 season. It's important to note as well, though, that um, the committee would continue to review any vaccine effectiveness data that becomes available and that recommendations could be revised based on any additional new information. Next slide, please. I just wanted to show you with this table um, a little bit of the historical progression of the changes in recommendation. So here you have in the first column the different years starting with 2013-14 season, which is the year where the live uh, quadrivalent influenza vaccine was introduced in the United States. And um, those three years from 2013 to 2016, you see that both ACIP and AAP recommended uh, both vaccines, the inactivated and the live vaccine uh, with no preference of one over the other. But during this period of time is where there was a report, there were reports coming from uh, CDC surveillance data that um, 
the effectiveness of the live vaccine against the H1N1 virus was inadequate and uh, lacking uh, for most of these years. Therefore, 2016, 17, and 17, 18 seasons, LAIV was not recommended by ACIP or AAP during those two years. 2018-19 is the season we just finished, and uh, as you can see, the, this is where we had a little bit of a difference in the recommendation where, although both vaccines uh, would be able to be utilized, AAP did express a preference for the inactivated vaccine given as a shot, with the LAIB given to children who would not otherwise receive their influenza vaccine. The majority of the vaccine utilized in the United States in that season was the shot, the inactivated influenza vaccine. And then again, this year, you see again the harmonization and concordance uh, of the recommendations utilizing both with no preference and all vaccines being quadrivalent. The next slide um, is going to show you, if you can pass the next slide, please. Uh, just a summary of some of the data that was available uh, prior to the decision of not using the live vaccine, uh, showing mostly that the problem was with the AH1N1 uh, pandemic uh, influenza strain, where the LAIV provided no effectiveness in children in various studies, including pool studies in the US and in a meta-analysis uh, uh, that, that was done for the different uh, seasons that occurred during that period of time. It also showed that uh, IIV was better than the LAIV for all age groups in the United States. And unfortunately, there were no US data on vaccine effectiveness for the live vaccine since 2015, simply because there was no circulation of the H1N1 strain during that period of time. But um, there was a change in the formulation of the vaccine so that the H1N1 strain was changed uh, to an A Slovenia strain uh, to try to address the issue of the lack of effectiveness of the H1N1 um, a strain existing in the vaccine. And this updated formulation of the vaccine of LAIV4 was utilized since the 2017-18 season in other countries such as the UK, Finland, and Canada. For H3N2 and for the B strains, uh, the vaccines were relatively equivalent, uh, except maybe for some uh, small groups. Uh, for example, the two and four-year-olds were um, the IIV was better for H3N2, but for B strains in some uh, reports, maybe LAIV had an, an advantage over uh, IIV, although that was not significant. The next slide, if you can please uh, pass to that one, uh, shows you the US uh, vaccine effectiveness data for 2018-19, which is the season that just passed, including all vaccine types, noting that most of the vaccine utilized in the United States was the inactivated vaccine. And this is preliminary data, but it shows you uh, overall that you can see against any influenza, so influenza A or B viruses, for various age groups, the adjusted vaccine effectiveness, which is the column before last, uh, varies quite uh, significantly. Um, and there was really very low vaccine effectiveness in children for 9 to 17 years of age with a confidence interval that crossed zero at minus 22 to 27, indicating actually a lack of effectiveness of the uh, vaccine that we used uh, last year for uh, 9 to 17 year olds. Um, if you see the contrast with that is the six month to eight year old children, 49% vaccine effectiveness with a positive confidence interval. So the vaccine seemed to work better for the younger children. Next slide, please. When you look at this table, which might be a little busy, but let me walk you through it. This is also looking at the United States adjusted vaccine efficacy for children specifically. And I have put there for you the year in the first column and uh, the different strains to break it up by strains, uh, H1N1, H3N2, B, and any influenza at the end uh, for the different age groups as mentioned. And you see that the overall data that I mentioned is at the end of the column with about 49% effectiveness for the younger children, uh, six months to eight years, and no effectiveness for the older children um, 
seven, nine, nine to 17 years of age with 6% BE. When you break it down by strains, you see that we um, do not have uh, really uh, much data on B, but certainly um, for H1N1 and H3N2, the younger children seem to have effectiveness, but not uh, the older children. Interestingly, as you know, um, the H3N2 strain had changed over time, and we had seen a lower effectiveness actually for all age groups uh, for H3N2 because the um, strain uh, was very different from that that was circulating, I'm sorry, was very different from the vaccine strain. And I showed you there the 1718 and 1617 data because, again, those were the two years where we're using mostly IIB. And you see that for the most part, the vaccine was effective, uh, except for 2017 18, for the again older children, 9 to 17, where we started to see the decreased effectiveness against the H3N2 strain. And then lastly, the 2015-16 season where you have the breakdown between the IIV with 60% effectiveness and LAIV, 5% uh, effectiveness, actually no effectiveness if you see the negative uh, confidence interval, which was the year again that um, we, we saw uh, uh, no uh, effectiveness, especially against H1N1, leading to the discontinuation of, of the recommendation to use. Um, next slide, please. So I just, again, to give you the background, in addition to that data, the committee looked at any other data that was published regarding estimates of VE for 2018-19, coming from other countries where, again, uh, there would be utilization of both LAIV and IIV. And of those, uh, Canada, Hong Kong, and Australia did not report specific data for LAIV, but they had overall uh, a positive vaccine effectiveness as preliminary data. And then uh, in Europe, the UK had provided a vaccine effectiveness uh, of LAIV specifically for children of 87% with a positive confidence interval against the H1N1 strain. So these were encouraging data. The next slide is going to just break it down for you a little bit more uh, with that data of that 87% for H1N1, uh, although the overall efficacy was interestingly negative already. Nevertheless, um, in terms of the decision-making for allowing or um, not having a preference, if I would say, uh, for IIV over LAIV, uh, this year was mostly based on, again, the fact that overall uh, the effectiveness for H1N1, as you can see here, for the two years, 17, 18, 18, 19, that provided by other uh, countries, especially UK, where they were utilizing it, had uh, been addressed by the change in formulation, or it looked like it had been addressed uh, for H1N1 specifically, yet we still had, um, you know, already, already concerns uh, for both IIV and LA. IV uh, with the H3N2 strains, and it was thought that both vaccines would be performing uh, similarly. Next slide, please. So we can uh, talk a little bit more about that at the question session, but I just wanted to share with you a, a, a table that um, lists the different vaccines that are available for children in 2019 and 20. And you can see, as was mentioned before, they are all uh, quadrivalent vaccine. Most of the vaccines are egg-based, and you have there the four uh, products that are available with different formulations and presentations. And then indication where most of these vaccines are now uh, recommended and available and indicated for six months of age and older. Um, noting that the 0.25 has half of the antigen content than the 0.5, which is uh, 15 micrograms. There's one cell culture-based vaccine available for children four years of age and older. And we have the live attenuated vaccine, which is available and recommended for children two years of age and older. Next slide, please. As Dr. Dawu mentioned, over the last year, since 2018, there have been new vaccine formulations that have been licensed. And so these are the ones that we have for children six to 35 months of age, where you have um, at least three options of pre-filled pre syringes uh, of uh, 0.5 mLs, and then uh, that's the Fluorix, Flulaval, and Fluzone. And then you have um, two options, a Fluria and Fluzone of 0.25 mL. 
based on clinical studies that looked at the 0.25 versus 0.5 ml formulations and uh, demonstrated equivalent efficacy and no increase in reactogenicity, any of these formulations can be used at the volumes that are indicated um, and the AAP expresses no preference. The next slide. Uh, shows you an updated figure that, show, that has the a number of vaccine doses that are recommended for children. And these are broken up now in two uh, columns. Um, the column to your right is going to be the children, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the children um, 9 to 17 years of age who we know need only one dose of influenza vaccine regardless of their previous vaccination history. And that is at uh, the 0.5 ml. The uh, columns to your uh, left are showing you the children six months through 18 years of age where the recommendations have not changed. If the children have received uh, two doses or more of any influenza vaccine before July 1st, 2019, then uh, they only should get one dose of influenza vaccine this year. But if the answer to this question is no, then they need two doses of influenza vaccine given four weeks apart. One clarification that was added is that we need to administer two doses based on the age at receipt of the first dose of the influenza vaccine during the season. So children who receive their first dose before their ninth birthday and need two doses should still receive the two doses even if they turn nine years old during the same season. The next two slides are going to show you just briefly, uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. The contraindications, this is coming from the MMWR document and basically for the inactivated and uh, the um, cell-based vaccines, the contraindications are related to allergic reactions with precautions being especially uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome after vaccine receipt and also any severe illness without, with or without fever. And the next table, uh, next slide, is just showing you that for LAIV, there are more contraindications, just again, because it's not a vaccine for children under two. It's not a vaccine for children who are not um, healthy. So those who might have asthma or other lung disease or immune suppression or other chronic diseases uh, should get the inactivated vaccine and not the LAIV. Uh, same thing for those who are pregnant or those who are already on treatment. Next slide. Uh, it's going to show you mostly uh, just a reminder about the egg allergy. This has not changed. And basically, based on many data, the uh, recommendation for uh, not needing to worry about egg allergy because it does not increase the risk of anaphylactic reaction in children who have history of egg allergies can receive uh, the influenza vaccines with no special precautions compared to any other vaccines. Only those that might have severe allergy could have um, you know, administration in places where they have uh, the ability to manage those. The next slide is a reminder regarding the options to improve influenza vaccination in pediatrics, making sure that it's easily accessible and having um, the opportunity for either walk-ins or vaccination clinics, extended hours, and taking advantage of even discharge from hospital stays where vaccination is possible. Um, as you can see, um, standing orders and making sure that uh, the vaccine is going to be given to not just the child, but parents and other individuals that are in their contact is important. Next slide. The uh, AAP recommendations also have a brief comment regarding the diagnosis of influenza. And in this one, um, you basically need to note that there are many options and most of the diagnosis is now made through PCR. And uh, we do need to consider the influenza activity in the community in order to uh, be testing. The next slide is part of the uh, document and is just a reminder of the different types of influenza diagnostic tests with, again, molecular-based assays being a lot more sensitive and more rapid to be able to give you a diagnosis. The next slide, please is a table uh, that reminds you about the presentation, a clinical presentation of influenza in children where you can have not just the respiratory symptoms with fever and cough, but also gastrointestinal symptoms which are more prominent in children than adults. And the next slide, um, shows you a number of complications that we do worry about in children, not just influenza pneumonia in and of itself, which is the classic pneumonia uh, presentation in the context of systemic illness, but secondary bacterial infections that could occur after influenza, particularly Staph aureus, pneumococcus, and um, 
and uh, uh, group A strep. We also have exacerbations of chronic lung disease, but encephalopathies, myositis, myocarditis, and sepsis-like syndrome could be a complication. And certainly, if you look at the next slide, please, the um, children under five during the period of influenza are, of course, well known to have increased medical uh, visits in the clinics and emergency departments during the season. And young children, especially those under two, have increased risk of hospitalization. We also have a potentially increased mortality in this age group due to these secondary infections, and therefore treatment is recommended. The next slide I am going to just skip because Dr. Dawu already pre presented that. So uh, this is just a reminder again that as far as we know, most of the children who uh, have uh, mortality from influenza, unfortunately, are previously healthy. So at least 50% uh, based on recent data and the majority, almost 80% had not been vaccinated. These are young children of a mean age of seven years. And you can see from infants to 17 years of age can succumb for influenza. Uh, therefore, the importance of vaccination. The next slide is just going to um, point out to two important uh, references regarding the ability of influenza vaccine to protect against severe influenza with hospitalization as a surrogate and death. So the first study shows that vaccinated children had 74 or 82% less likelihood to be admitted to the intensive care unit for influenza compared to unvaccinated, but those who needed two doses uh, needed to have the two doses to be protective. One single dose for uh, children who need two doses was not protective. And then in terms of death, um, again, 65% vaccine effectiveness against mortality in children six months to 17 years, years old in the second study. And I would like to remind everybody to tell their, their parents, their patients, that uh, we also uh, have this benefit of influenza vaccination. Even if children do get the flu, they could have a uh, decrease in these complications and mortality. And then uh, the next slide, please, is just a summary. Dr. Daiwu already presented this to you, but just to point out, this table is also available in the AAP recommendations regarding the antivirals. And the next slide uh, confirms the same recommendations harmonized with CDC that uh, are not changed from the previous year. We need to treat uh, patients who are hospitalized, those with severe influenza, progressive disease, or those with high-risk conditions, and consider treatment for those uh, who have influenza based on clinical decision making. I will uh, then next move to the next slide, please. Just again to point out that the high-risk groups are the same for treatment and for vaccination. And this list is the same as you have with the CDC. And the conclusions for the next slide uh, are just a summary that you can have uh, handy, again, about our recommendations uh, for no preference and that all vaccines can be utilized based on their uh, stated indication, the new formulations for the young children, the dosing recommendations and the high-risk groups that need to be immunized, importance to uh, vaccinate by end of October and through the season, no egg allergy uh, concerns, and the next and final slide it gives you the neuraminidase inhibitors and endonuclease inhibitor recommendations and uh, which are available for treatment and prophylaxis. And um, thank you for that. I'll finish with that with my last slide. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Dawood and Dr. Munoz. We will now go into our Q&A session. Please remember you may submit your questions through the webinar system by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and then typing your question. Our first question is regarding um, the um, recommendation to have healthcare professionals be vaccinated. The question asks, when do you recommend hospital workers get their flu shots? Dr. Munoz, would you like me to take this one? Yes, sure. Great. Um, this is Fatima Dawood speaking. Um, the recommendation is that um, all people get the influenza vaccine by the end of October, um, taking into consideration that we don't always know when flu activity will begin and or peak. So the key message is get vaccinated by the end of October. Thank you. The next question asks, is there a prediction that this year may be unusually dangerous or prolonged? So this is Fatima Dawood again. I can I can take that one. Um, so 
it's always hard to predict what flu season is going to look like. I showed some data from the southern hemisphere, um, but we really can't um, necessarily predict from what we saw in the southern hemisphere what we're going to see this upcoming flu season. Um, so again, the key message is get vaccinated. It's the best way to protect ourselves and our patients from influenza. Um, and we'll be continuing to monitor through the season, check back on flu view uh, as the season progresses to get updates. Thank you. Our next question asks, what are recommendations for oseltamivir use in premature infants? I think I can take that one, if that's okay. This is Flor Munoz. So um, premature infants can receive oseltamivir, and this is based on their uh, chronological age post-birth. And actually, um, there is a table with uh, recommendations for dosing that includes term infants and preterm infants um, in the uh, AAP policy statement and also in a separate document um, that recommends antivirals, uh, I, I believe, from, from uh, CDC. But basically, yes, you can utilize, you can use um, asaltamivir in premature babies. It's just that dosing might be a little bit different, uh, which is weight adjusted. Thank you. Can you please address uh, if it's uh, appropriate uh, uh, to uh, administer a flu shot and an allergy shot on the same day, or if there's a minimal interval you recommend? So let me let me try to address that one. I guess allergy shots would be specific for certain allergic conditions, and. Um, they would not necessarily interfere with the vaccination with influenza. Um, in general, I have not seen any specific recommendations indicating that you cannot give them at the same time. Um, the inactivated influenza vaccine should not be affected by allergy shots. Thank you. The next question asks if you could please uh, reiterate the recommendations by the agency and AAP for intranasal live attenuated influenza vaccine. Sure, so this is Fatima Dawood. I can uh, start that one and then Dr. Munoz may want to add uh, to what I say. Um, the live attenuated influenza vaccine or LAIV is recommended this season as one of several vaccine options. There's no preference um, per the ACIP recommendations for whether to give LAIV or IIV, inactivated vaccine, um, as long as an individual doesn't have a contraindication to LAIV. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone, LAIV is licensed for persons two through 49 years of age. Um, people who should not receive LAIV per the ACIP recommendations include uh, children two to four years of age who have been diagnosed with asthma or had a wheezing episode in the last 12 months. Anyone who's immunocompromised or close contacts and caregivers of immunocompromised persons, pregnant women, and anyone who's had an antiviral medication in the past 48 hours. And I can, uh, this is Flor Munoz, I would uh, also speak for the AAP recommendations, which are harmonized with the ACIP recommendations. And for this year, both IIV and LAIV can be used in children with no preference. Thank you. Can you please also comment or address uh, on the possibility of waning immunity if the flu season starts later? Uh, I suppose the inquirer is wondering if you would recommend revaccination in a high risk population in such a scenario. Um, I can start, and again, Dr. Dawood could also comment, but at this time, there is no recommendation for a second dose or revaccination uh, except for the children less than eight years of age, so six months to eight years who are receiving vaccine for the first time or who are in completely vaccinated in the previous seasons. So the question of waning immunity, I know, has been um, discussed over time, and there is quite a bit of work being done in that arena, but the, the data uh, are not indicating that it's necessary to delay the vaccination or to give a second dose at this time, uh, especially in children. The data is very, very scarce. 
This is Fatima Dawood. I can just add to that that um, Dr. Munoz's comments um, cover the CDC recommendations as well. There is no recommendation to revaccinate uh, even in high risk populations at the present time. Um, the data on waning immunity really are mixed and we have a lot more to learn about that area. Um, but as of now, the recommendation is, as I mentioned earlier, get vaccinated by the end of October to be well covered for whenever the season does begin. Thank you. And our last question um, asks, uh, how do you um, counsel or recommend clinicians to um, consult families who are worried about the effectiveness of the influenza vaccine? This is Fatima Dawood. I can, I can start with that one and Dr. Munoz may want to add. Um, so I think the key message for families is that the best way to protect our children, our families, ourselves from influenza is through getting vaccinated. And as Dr. Munoz showed in her talk, there is a large body of data now that shows that um, the vaccine is effective when the vaccine viruses and circulating viruses are well matched. Influenza vaccines reduce the risk of getting flu by about a half. And then there are now also studies that show that flu vaccines can reduce the risk of getting hospitalized with influenza, requiring intensive care and even death. Um, so there's lots of data to support that vaccines work and that they're our best protection against the flu. And this is for Munoz. I would uh, concur 100% with that uh, statement. It's important to let parents know that the flu vaccine, uh, despite its variability and effectiveness over time, which is inherent to the fact that different strains circulate year to year and that the uh, match and the effectiveness of the vaccine varies by age, health status, and other factors, that it is the best method we have to prevent influenza and its complications, not just influenza. So even if someone does develop the flu after vaccination, you do have a very good a uh, chance of having protection against most severe influenza, hospitalization, and death, especially those at high risk. So please vaccinate. Thank you for that. If we were not able to get to your questions, please send your questions to coca at cdc.gov. On behalf of COCA, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today with a special thank you to our presenters, Dr. Fatima Daoud and Dr. Flor Munoz. The recording of this call and the transcript will be posted within the next few days to the COCA website at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. Again, that web address is emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. All continuing education for COCA calls are issued online through TCE Online, the CDC Training and Continuing Education Online System at www.cdc.gov forward slash TCE online. Those who participated in today's COCA call and would like to receive continuing education should complete the online evaluation by October 29, 2019 and use course code WC2922. Those who will review the call on demand and would like to receive continuing education should complete the online evaluation between October 29, 2019 and October 29, 2021 and use course code WD2922. Please join us for our next COCA call that will be held on Thursday, October 24 at 2 p.m. Eastern. And the topic will be new interim guidance related to enhanced barrier precautions in nursing homes to prevent the spread of multi-drug resistant organisms. To receive information on upcoming COCA calls or other COCA products and services, Join the COCA mailing list by visiting the COCA webpage at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA and click on the join the COCA mailing list link. To stay connected to the latest news from COCA, be sure to like and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash CDC clinician outreach and communication activity. Again, thank you for joining us for today's call. Have a great day.